Amen. 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 How are you guys doing today? Everybody doing all right? Does anyone love Jesus here today? That was so-so. Does anybody love Jesus in second service today? Let's go. All right, so we are in week two of our Counterfeit Faith series, and so we've got the second counterfeit in your life, because if we understand what's counterfeit, we could get to the real thing uh, by God's grace. So let's look at Proverbs chapter 18, verse 24. Look at what it says here. It says, a man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. So this is kind of the theme verse for today. And, and the Bible here in the book of Proverbs compares two different things. It says you can have a life with a lot of companions, a lot of acquaintances, a lot of people that you know. And that's, that's one thing. Or you can have a deep friend. Do you have a deep friend? And the deep friend who sticks closer than a brother. What's he saying there? Think about your family for a second, because he's saying a friend that sticks closer than a sibling. Think about your family. Your family loves you. Your family is loyal to you. They would be there for you if you needed them. But let's be real. They kind of have to, right? Like they were born into it. They were born into your circle. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It's just what he's saying here is friend is different because friend chose you. And if you can find a friend who chose you, they opted into relationship with you and they stick as close to you, loyalty and love. They stick as close to you as family. You have found a wonderful treasure. Amen. And and what do you want to live? And I'm just This is not going to be super pushy today. It's not going to be super necessarily convicting as far as sin. I think the Bible just wants to encourage us today into a richer life than maybe what we're living right now. Because some of us, we're, we're, we're a mile wide and we're one inch deep on our friends. We've got many companions. But who are we investing in? And who are we letting in to be this kind of friend who sticks closer than a brother? Uh, it starts in the scripture with the Trinity. And I, I know that sounds ultra theological, right? But Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Godhead, it, 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 the three persons of God. And we have to start there because one of the things I want you to know is that friendship started in God first before we came along. Friendship started with him, right? The father loved the son. The son loves the Holy Spirit. They have joy. They have peace. They have companionship together before we ever came along. You see it so well in uh, uh, the baptism of Jesus. Do you remember when Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan River? And what was the son doing? The son is submitting and obeying to God the father. That's the relationship that they have. And then God the Father comes in with the voice from heaven, right? Saying, this is my son. He belongs to me, who I love. In him I'm well pleased. Talking him up, celebrating, right? Shouting for him. And then the Holy Spirit comes in what form? The dove. And it's this visual representation of the affirmation of the Holy Spirit on the entire scene. And in that little picture, you see the Trinity of God, three persons, all uniquely present, and all just hyping each other up. I love that. I love the health of that, right? And so God himself had health before we came along, had friendship before we came along. might sound weird to you, but it's necessary that we understand. Why? Because See, God didn't create humanity out of a place of loneliness. See, if you create humanity out of a place of loneliness, well, now you're needy about humanity, right? Like, that's not the kind of situation you want in any kind of parent-child relationship. Think about your parents for a second. If they had you because they needed more companionship, that's a problem, right? Because then you're going to turn 18 someday, and you're going to want to leave that home, and they're not going to want you to leave, and and the apron strings, and they're going to want to try and hold on and control because they needed you all along. And let's be real, you need them to not need you. You need them to love you. 
And those are two different things. What you should have is you should have a man and a woman who come together in marriage and they love each other and they're enough. And out of the overflow of their love, they have children out of the overflow of their love. And when it's out of the overflow of their love, that when they turn 18, it's, it's, sure, it's going to be painful, but it's like, there they go off to college. Praise God. I, I didn't mean it like that, but that's, that's how you took it, and I don't know. Anyway. That didn't happen for a service, I'm just saying. <laughs> Think about the Lord of the Rings. Have you seen Lord of the Rings? Like this huge movie franchise, right? And, and it's based on books. How many of you, like show of hands, how many of you have read the books? All right, you literature people, I love it. All right? One of the things that you'll see if you read the books is that all the romances, they're not in the main story. So, so uh, Arwen and, and, and uh, Aragorn, like that's not in the main story. You know where Tolkien put those romances? They're in the appendix. Why? Because the main story of Lord of the Rings is friendship. It's Frodo and Sam. That's actually the center of that story. Is two people come together and they have to defend each other and they have to be loyal to each other and they have to go through this great adventure and this terrible thing and they have to... And what do they become by the end of the story? They're the best of friends. Right? And, and don't you admire their friendship by the time you get to the end of that story? Because you know what they have. They have a treasure between the two of them. And our culture has lost that. Han Solo and Chewbacca, amen? <laughs> Steve Rogers and Bucky Barnes, where's my Marvel people at? Right? Harry, Ron, and Hermione. Buzz and Woody. Timon and Pumbaa. There are more. Anyway. Now, friendship love is different than romantic love. And we know that. And friendship love should be there as the basis of a romance. Amen? As the basis of a marriage. But it is not the same thing. And you have to see them separately in order to understand. And I want to say this just quickly. If you're married here today, and this is an area of struggle for you, I hope that you'll, you'll grasp this today. I think it's important. Part of the reason it's important is because if you've got a spouse, you need your spouse to have friends. You need your spouse. You'll be a healthier marriage if your spouse has strong friendships outside the marriage. You're like, well, I'm threatened by that, and I'm afraid that, 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 that they'll go and they'll give all that good stuff to somebody else and not give it to me. It's not the way that it works. Part of the thing is you're going to find that if you shut off those exterior friendships to the family, that your spouse will come back to you, and they will attempt to have all their emotional and relational needs met by you alone, and you're not enough, and you'll struggle You'll struggle with a sense of too much demands. Encourage them out of the house, especially when the kids are young, and especially when things are crazy and it doesn't feel like anybody can get out of the house. Devote some nights when you get her out of the house. Amen? Devote some nights when you get him out of the house and build up those friendships strong because that way you'll have strong support system outside the marriage. Now, friendship is not based on attraction. It's based on commonality, something in common, right? Like you collect stamps, maybe. You find another stamp collector, you're set. Like that might not be most of us, right? <laughs> but it's all about commonality. It's like, well, you, I mean, that's the basis of, you, of the friendships you've got, right? Like, like, like you have something in common. Like it can even be a tough thing. It could be two alcoholics who decide at the same time that they're going to finally go to AA and they meet each other there. And we're going to conquer this demon that's in our life. And all of a sudden, Frodo and Sam go walking down the road to Mordor, you know what I mean? Together. And that's an amazing thing. There's all, you, it, it could be love of literature. It could be love, you know, serving the poor. It could be we're going to accomplish this great thing. We're going to overcome this thing from our childhood. It could be all kinds of things that form the commonality between you. But the deeper the thing is, the deeper the friendship may be. 
C.S. Lewis said this. He said, the typical expression of opening friendship would be something like, what, you too? I thought I was the only one. Once commonality is uncovered, the friend is revealed as a fellow traveler, one who walks in the same direction as you. And this is what our hearts deeply long for, is this level of commonality, this level of being known by somebody else, right? You go through the fight together, and you form a bond that never ends. Now, I talked about counterfeits before. We're going to go into counterfeits now. I'm going to ruin the ending of the, the message here. See, here's how I believe this works for us. We're going to talk about counterfeit friends, and we're going to talk about what real friends look like. And the reason we're going to hold the two against each other is because I believe that many of us in this room and online, what we've done is we've kind of filled up our lives with friends that aren't super healthy for us. It's that ocean of companions. And because of that, because we've brought fakes and counterfeits so much into our lives, what we've done is we've, we, we've convinced ourselves the friendship box is checked and we're good. And we've held back from investing in good friends and healthy friends that will make us healthier people. And so we got to talk about the counterfeits so that you can identify them and get toward the good stuff. Does that make sense? And I'm going to say things like counterfeit friends, and that's going to sound really terrible to you because you're going to think about people's faces when I say this. And you're going to be like, don't call that person a fake friend because that's not who they are. And I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus this morning. But some of the relationships we're going to talk about, they're a little bit like, if I could say, junk food. They're just not the depth that you need. And they're fine people, and they're good people, and they may be that depth for somebody else. They're just not for you. So my point isn't to bash these individuals today, so please don't take this that way. My point is simply to say, there are, there's some health food around you, and that's what you need more of. So let's go after fake friends. The first kind of fake friend category I'm going to give you is cruel friends. Cruel friends. This is Proverbs 19, 4, wealth makes many friends, poverty drives them all away. These are friends for what, what you can bring to them. The next verse, verse 6, many seek the favor of a generous man, and everyone is a friend to a man who gives gifts. In short, these are people that are using you for what they can get out of you. Users, right? Here's the thing. You use plenty of people. So do I. Right? Like, we all use each other. Can we be real? Like we're a very inter interdependent group of people. We need each other for a lot of different things. And there's a lot of people you sweet-talked last week in order to get the things that you needed. That's just true. <laughs> That's just true. So, again, I'm not bashing that, Okay. I'm not bashing it for you or for them. I'm just saying you can't build your most precious core of friendships on that. You just, you need to know the difference. Who is, who has got me because of what they can get? Go back to junior high and go to the lunchroom in your mind. And all those little junior high kids, boys and girls, trying to climb the little junior high social ladder. Amen? Right? Like, and they're all using each other. And some people are, are, are looking to you like, if I make a friendship with him or I sit at his table, that'll bump me up just a little bit, right? Little junior high brains could figure all that stuff out. And we, we still do that with each other, where we're social positioning with each other all the time. It's just a form of using each other. Part of what, what gets difficult is when you don't understand that person's not loyal to you. Or that they won't care for you and be there for you when the chips are down. That's when your heart gets broken. The other place where your heart can get broken and where things can go bad is when you invest so much in that kind of a group of relationships. And those relationships attempt to drag you down. Right? These are the people that your parents warned you about. Like There was a group of, of kids that, that were in high school and, and it was a group that I wanted to be a part of. But they were the alcohol drinking kids. And so I drank alcohol in order to be part of that group. 
And there's a lot of different friendship groups that have an entry fee at the, at the front, right? Like, you've got to do this in order to be part of that group. And, and, and again, that's why your parents warn you about that. It's like, who are you getting involved with? And some of them unabashedly will kick you out of their little group if you don't do the things that they require. And, 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 and I get it. But if you're here today and that's all you've ever seen, that is not the world of friendship that the Bible talks about. And it's not the world of friendship that we're called to or that's healthy for you. Those have been cruel friends. And you've not been able to be yourself and you've not been able to be free from being used by others. What you've done, if that's all the friends that you've ever had, you have been a chameleon. And you have to show a side of yourself to this group of people. And then when you leave that group of people, you become something entirely different. And being a chameleon and living a double, triple, quadruple life is exhausting. It's not what God wants for you. Next is the highlight real friends highlight reel. It's like, is that the real me or is that the highlight reel, right? So I was at home yesterday and we have an Apple TV connected to our television set and, and when nothing's playing on it, just all day long, it cycles through some of our, our pictures, our, our database of pictures at the, at the True Blood family. And, and so two of Gracie's friends came in yesterday and while they were standing there in the kitchen, I was talking to them and they're like, hey, Mr. True Blood, is, some, is there a member of your family, are they a photographer? And I'm like, no, why do you ask? And they're like, because all the pictures that are on your TV and keep cycling through, everybody's smiling, everything, everything's kind of like set up right and good lighting and all that kind of stuff. Like, do you have a photographer? And I'm like, no. I'm like, what happened is when our kids were born, digital cameras were just coming out. Yeah, I'm that old. And they were just coming out. And so by this time, we've got like, I don't know, 12 to 17,000 pictures in our database. And we've gone through there and we've just like, we've kind of hearted and, and loved the, uh, or favorited the, uh, just the best ones. And so there's maybe 100 that cycle through the TV out of like 15,000. So no, we're not a photographer. We just got the best ones out there. <laughs> Sound like anybody's Facebook profile or Instagram feed? Right? Like, they, this is what we do. Like, we, we put the highlight reel out there. You're going to see our greatest hits, and that's all you're going to see. And, and, and if all your friendships are built on that idea... See, again, I'm not trying to bash social media today. That's not the point. There are blessings from social media, especially for those of us that are very far apart from friends and family, and it allows us to stay connected. Praise God for that. But if you make your entire diet based on social media, it's, it's not enough. And it will hurt you because it's just highlight reels. You need to be around people. You need to be invested in people who see you when you have a bad hair day. When you wake up in a bad mood, they experience your bad mood. They need to be around you enough and experience enough of the real you where they have all those experiences. This is what Josh looks like when he's angry. Ugh. Like they need to know. You gain some weight. You lose some weight, right? Like back and forth. Like they need to see it all. That's knowing you, not just the highlight reel version of you. And there's, there's part of you that down deep is smart enough to know that when all they see of me is the highlight reel, they don't know the real me and they haven't accepted the real me and therefore I'm not really loved by them. We need more. The miracle of friendship is to be fully known by someone else. The next kind of false friend or fake friend, counterfeit friend, this is distant, distant. Um, anybody ever see Ready Player One, the movie, right, based on a book? There's the picture right there. So Ready Player One is written 10 years ago, and is this concept of, um, hey, at some point in the future, the idea will be that all the online gaming, all the li online social media, it will eventually converge into absolute immersion experience where we put on the goggles, we put on the gloves, and we're completely in this other world. 
And the idea of the book is that things in the real world have gotten so bad that everybody's retreating into this uh, digital experience. And if you watch the movie, you get the story. It's like the, the author of the book is actually very optimistic about this future life. Like, it's no big deal if we all eventually move to a fully digital experience. And that's the only place we really live. That's kind of the idea of the book. It's kind of built into it. But what's sad is, like, you start moving through the story, and, and they, what they do is they, the, the characters in there who are in the digital world, they find that they're not feeling things, and they long to feel things. And they long to feel mo more and more things. And the, the, eventually, at one point, he like wins an award, and because of the award, he's able to get a full body suit where every square inch of his body can feel sensations based on what's going on in the digital world. And I know that's a lot of heady stuff, but what's the guy trying to do? He's trying to get back to the real world. He's trying to have a realistic experience in that fake experience. Do you see it just cycle? It's kind of madness. It's kind of chaos. My daughter told me this week, she said, um, when people are using technology too much in her generation, they'll use this phrase. They'll say, go touch some grass. Like, you're just, you're kind of into this too much. You need to go touch some grass. You need to go spend some time outside. You need to be reminded of what's real again. Especially in the realm of friendships, right? Like this last year with COVID, has it not taught us that a future, totally isolated, immersive life completely online is not a positive picture? It's not a positive picture. Because we don't know how to function there. We need something about this real world face-to-face -face experience that forces us to see each other's faces. Smell each other even, God help us right? Like you need to know, you need to see. Tim Keller said it like this. He said, our individual relationships, they are thinned out. They're based on images rather than presences. To be a healthy person, you need some presences in your life. That's the basis for friendship. And, I, and, and let, let me just acknowledge real quick. I know for some of you, your deepest friendships right now, especially those of you that are military, you've PCS into this place. Some of your deepest friendships are at another base right now. I heard somebody talking about Zoom and what a blessing it is for folks who are, who are brothers and sisters to still be connecting today, states away from each other on Zoom. And I totally agree, and that's wonderful. But can I just remind you of something? That relationship started in the real. Right? When you were kids growing up, and you did smell each other and see each other and notice each other's moods. Right? Like, you're, you're, having, your, you're having your reconnections together online right now, but all that foundation is there. And it's okay for maintenance, but that's not where you build a new friendship that's precious to you. Real community. Let's talk about real community for a second. So Brooke had these leaders up here, and we got all these new groups that are out in the lobby today. What are they for? Those are what I'm going to call communities. Those are Jesus-loving, Bible-studying, loving each other kind of communities is what we're trying to create. This is actually in the book of Acts do you know this is based on scripture? This is not like some new church idea, right? So 2,000 years ago in the city of Jerusalem, when the very first mega church started, after Jesus rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and the church started, there's this little verse in Acts 2.42, and it says that the church weekly would meet in the temple courts. That's a large group like we're doing today. And then they would get together day by day in homes throughout the week. And they would know each other. And they would take the Lord's Supper. And they would study scripture together. And they would love and help each other. And it's such an important thing that we see that they were in homes throughout the week. Because you can't have the big monster church all together inside of somebody's house, right? So it doesn't tell us that there were 10 to 20 people probably in that home. But just think about size for a second, right? Some of you would be stressed just about 20 people inside your house, right? 
So it was necessarily a small group of people that could what? They could know each other. Even in the New Testament, they could know each other. And you need that today. So that's why we're doing life groups. And we want you guys to get into that, partly because there's all kinds of reasons. Like we want you to study the Bible. We want you to grow. We want you to get free of your hurts, habits, and hangups, right? Like we want all that kind of stuff to happen in those communities. But also, it's a fishing pond. Your life group is a group of people who are also trying to follow Jesus. And you go there and you get to know those people. And some of those people may become your future friendships you got to try them out. And I say that and just just trying to be really, really practical with you. Some of you guys are listening to me today and you're like, yeah, yeah, pastor, but I've tried friendship before and I got burned and things went bad and I've stopped trying. I'm just going to say it's time to try again. It's time to expose yourself into a group of people again and get real and commit and see what God might do with those friendships. And some of those people in those groups, they're weird, right? Some of them are weird. They're not going to be your future friends. Like, we just don't have chemistry. Love you, dude, but we just don't, we're just not going to do that. And that's okay. But you've got to get into those communities in order to find those people. Because most of us are not going to find the best friends of our lives on a Sunday morning. So it's a fishing pond. All right, so let's talk about what a good fishing pond actually looks like. So here's four essentials of real community. And if you're a life group leader today, listen close because your group should be doing this. Number one, it should be a loving group. You should be sacrificing for each other, forgiving each other, bearing burdens. Uh, Proverbs 17, 17, a friend is always loyal and a brother is born to help in a time of need. Like, When you're in that group and you're getting to know each other, as soon as the needs come up naturally, like they will, you respond to that. I talked about Linda and I's library of pictures before. If you really scan that library of pictures, you would see pictures from the day that we moved this family. You're like, I hate to move people, but it's part of it, right? You'd see the day that Brian and Amy adopted AJ. We were at the courthouse. The whole group was at the courthouse with them taking pictures together, supporting them, celebrating that moment with them. Jen Kestel, single mom, adopted like five different kids, and I'm not exaggerating, five different kids. And we, we helped her and fixed things at her house and did all the things that you need to do, right? And somebody would have a baby, and you go and you take the meals over to their house, and you set the meal train up, and you got to have a group of people that you're responsible to love. You're like, well, that's my little family. It is your little family, but it's also the people of God. Like we do that together, like Frodo and Sam, it knits us together. It's part of it. You got to love each other, not just do your Bible study. You got to have time for each other. Next, you got to be worshipful is the next essential. You do have to do the Bible study part. Why? Because your commonality is Jesus. What brings you there into that space is that we respect God's word, the Bible, and we love Jesus, and we're trying to go a common direction together. So you got to be worshipful together as well. Third, you have to be authentic. So this is Galatians 6, 2. Carry each other's burdens, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. Bear each other's burdens. You're like, I thought I was just supposed to carry my own burden. You are, but we also carry each other's when we're in community. And it teaches us something really important about each other. We can go further together. And you got to be that. And it's not just for physical things. It's also for the emotional stuff. Because you can can show up physically to life group and not show up emotionally to life group. And you keep way back here. So you got to be authentic. But there's a a group that my old lead pastor, Bob C., went to. and, And they were studying Revelation together for like a year. And he was like, it was the coolest Bible study in Revelation I'd ever gone to. He's like, but at the end of the year... One of the couples said, you know what? We just filed for divorce last week because our marriage has been falling apart for the last six months. He's like, why were we studying Revelation when your marriage was falling apart? We were supposed to be there for each other. Nothing wrong with Revelation. Study it. It's great. But who's that group of people that if your marriage fell apart tomorrow, somebody would have seen this coming? See, that's a friend. 
you know it's a friend. They're the ones who know day by day, week by week, this is the real stuff that's happening with me right now. That needs to be your group, and does your group have space for that? And then the last aspect is it's got to be a group that is present. It's got to be physically present. Ephesians, or Ecclesiastes 4, verse 8. This is the case of the man who is all alone, without a child or a brother. It is all so meaningless and depressing. (laughs) That's just so blunt, isn't it? (laughs) This whole section of scripture there in Ecclesiastes is all just like, don't be alone. God has given you friendships, and I know they're a pain in the butt to build, but you've got to dedicate yourself to it. You need these people, and you've got to be, I I said authentic was being emotionally present. This is the part where you do have to be physically present. So many of our group leaders, they can tell you stories of times that they've cleaned up their house, and they did the study, and they made the treats, and out of 15 people that are supposed to come to their group, two people showed up. And it's, I get it, and it, it, we're busy, and, and, and things are happening and stuff, but there are certain things that you in your family, you already know this. You, these, are, these things, in my week, they're not optional. You know what that is. There's a line. There's a box you draw around those things. These things are not optional. And what that means is the busyness doesn't impact those things because we'll do those things no matter what. And these, this friendship, this, it's not optional. You need this to be healthy in your life. So be present. And if, if you go to a community like this and you find some healthy friends, here's just some more about the kind of healthy friends you could find. First off is a loyal friend, is a healthy friend. John 15, 13, Jesus said this, there is no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friend. I just, I love this statement. There's something about friends that sacrifice for each other no matter what. I had an old friend, Todd Bettis is his name, and he and I were at a spot. We were in life group together, and I remember talking to Todd and saying, hey, you know, like if you have an emergency, can I call you? And you can call me, and and we did. And there was a night where it's like I had to take Linda and one of our kids to the emergency room. And who's going to stay back with the other two kids and guard my house physically and make sure everybody's safe? I called Todd in the middle of the night. He drove right over, slept on my couch all night long. You know the feeling of coming back in your door after three insane hours at the ER? It's like at least my kids were safe. Because there's Todd. And he'd call me. And we were just that. That's what that is. Do you have that kind of relationship that's loyal in that way? The next one's full access, friends. You need somebody that's not highlight reel. They are absolutely 100% full access to you and you to them. And that takes time to build. It's not a light switch. John 15, 15, Jesus said this. He said, I no longer call you slaves because a master does not confide in his slaves. Now you are my friends, friends. This is how Jesus defines friends. Since I have told you everything the father told me. Jesus says... You're my friends because I haven't held anything back. I've told it all to you. And that's what friendship is. It's not, it's not highlight reel. And, and, and it's so funny because this verse right here, this is just like kind of blows my mind because when the Bible was written, there wasn't social media. There's so many modern things, like for you that are trying to figure out how to read the Bible, right? Like, how do I read this 2,000-year-old book even though I live in a modern age? Just like this, right? It doesn't talk about Facebook, and it doesn't talk about Instagram, but it basically does because he's saying you can't live a highlight reel friendship, and it addresses it. So we have the principles of God that are absolutely timeless and they help us at all times to interpret the modern, modern world in which we live. And when we feel the brokenness that's all around us, the Bible is there to help us understand why it's also broken. You don't have to be broken by everything else that breaks your generation. You get to come to scripture with a timeless God and say, God, interpret all this for me. Help me figure all this out. Help me to escape it all. And he's got you. Amen? There's a, there's a statement in Alcoholics Anonymous. They say you're only as sick as your secrets. P. 
people got to know you. And they got to know the real you. Who in this world knows that you were abused when you were a child? Who does? Who knows that that's, that's what you're carrying into your marriage and you wrestle with that and you wrestle with the, the feelings and the impact from that every single day with your spouse and your spouse doesn't even know yet. Who knows? Somebody has to know. Because if you can find that person who can know that thing about you, that's the person you won't be a chameleon with. That's the person you'll, you'll really be known by them. And if they accept you and they love you, you'll be loved for who you are, not for who you've made yourself out to be. Don't you need that? You need that. Scripture calls you to that. Mature friends is the next one. Almost done. Proverbs 27, 6, wounds from a sincere friend are better than many kisses from an enemy. You need friends in, in your life that are not immature, that are maturing, that are seeking after Jesus, because then they will, they will pull you, instead of, instead of pull you down into the mud, they will pull you up toward the light. And so you need mature friends in your life. And then last is upward friends. 1 Corinthians 15, 33, don't be fooled by those who say such things for bad company corrupts good character. And that's where your parents got that phrase, by the way, when you were a teenager. They said that to you. Be careful who you're around. Last story. There's this time in 2 Kings 7 and there's a city named Samaria. I need you to picture it really quick. A walled city. It's not Jericho, it's Samaria. And a foreign army comes in and they start attacking this city of God's people. And they're the Arameans. And they do something called laying siege. They lay siege to the city. Some of you military people know what this means. It means basically their whole plan is we're not necessarily going to destroy the walls. We're just going to surround it and cut them off from the outside world. And we're going to wait them out. Right? And there's no Amazon Prime drones that could drop things into the middle of the city. Right? Like, so when they cut them off as, a, as an army, like they cut them off. And what started to happen inside the city is people started to starve. They had no water. They had no food. They had no supplies. So the strategy was effective. And there's four lepers, and they're outside the city. You know where those four lepers are outside the city? Because they're outcasts, right? So they're outside the city gate. And they're standing there one day. This is 2 Kings 7, 3. It says, now there were four men with leprosy sitting at the entrance. Why should we sit here waiting to die? They say, we will starve if we stay here. But with the famine in the city, we will starve if we go back there. So we may as well go out and surrender to the Aramean army. See their logic here for a second. It's brilliant. This is some really smart lepers. If we go to the Aramean army, if they let us live, so much the better. But if they kill us, we would have died anyway. What have we got to lose? Here we are stuck. And so the, the way the story goes is that what everybody didn't know in Samaria or the lepers is the night before, God had done a miracle. And he had made all the Arameans hear the sound of an approaching army they all freaked out. You're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Have you ever thought you heard an intruder in your house in the middle of the night? Now, how much more powerful is the illusion when God sends it to you as a miracle? Uh-huh. Like you're freaking out. So they all freak out. They hop on their horses and they get out of Dodge, right? And they leave all their tents behind, all their food behind, all their supplies and clothes behind. And so our, our very smart, logical lepers go walking into that, those tents and nobody's there. And I imagine it's barbecue waiting for them because I always imagine barbecue. <laughs> and they start eating and having a great time. And it's awesome and to try and on the clothes and realize they've struck it rich and Four goofy lepers here in the middle of all this stuff. And here's what they end up saying, verse 9. Finally, they said to each other, this is not right. This is a day of good news, and we aren't sharing it with anyone. If we wait until morning, some calamity will certainly fall on us. 
Come, let us go back and tell the people at the palace. That means inside the city. So they, they follow a journey here, the lepers do. And they go from starving lepers to buffeting lepers to sharing lepers. When it comes to friendships, where are you? Are you starving? I think most of us are. We're just in a place where we haven't invested, we've self-protected, we've kept pe pe people at a distance, and it's hurting us. If you're in that kind of a place, you need to sign up for a group today, and you need to give people a chance. You need to try some things out, and you need to dedicate yourself to it, and friendship needs to become an absolute must in your life. If you're in the second category, if you are currently buffeting at Grace Fellowship Church and your list of friends who love you and are loyal to you and are present with you and you're happy and you're like, thank God, this whole message is like, thank God. If you're buffeting, maybe you need to move to sharing because there's people sitting in these rows next to you right now and they come into church. You know what people come into church? They assume church is a click. Did you know that? It doesn't have to be a click. We just assume it's a click. But when you reach to the person next to you in church this morning before they leave and you say, why don't you come to my life group with me? They'll know it's not a click. We just, a lot of us need an invitation. So if you're buffet, could I ask you to pull some people to the buffet with you? Or maybe it's time for you to start your own life group because you've been in a great group for a long time and you show up and everything's set up before you. It's time for you to serve in the kingdom of God. Amen? Would you stand right now? Let's pray. God, I love how you love us. I love that you would spend so much time in your word just talking about friendship, God. And some of us, we've spent a lot of time thinking about friendship like it was optional stuff, like it was extra. And God, it's not extra. And Lord, I pray, God, where, where maybe we've, maybe we felt dinged a lot, Lord, this morning with like all this talk of like counterfeit friendships. And maybe we're just feeling very, very empty and very poor this morning and just not feeling like we've got much in this realm. God, I pray that what you would see is that Jesus is calling each one of us to more. And you're encouraging us forward. So Lord, I pray you put a spirit in us, Lord, that takes risks again and that reprioritizes things, and that we take action. We don't just get inspired. We don't just listen to church. We don't just check a box on a Sunday morning, Lord, but that we're willing to change our lives. God, help us to change. And Lord, I pray for a blessing all across this congregation of amazing friendships, Lord, that come out of this season. Bring us joy, Lord, in Christ's name.